But he did not say that to me. Um, it was just an impression. Uh, when I say that the Lord that spoke to me, it was just one of those impressions on my spirit, on my my knower, as uh, Priscilla Shire says. She says, you know it in your knower. You just know it. That the Lord was saying, uh, I looked back at our pretty house that we love so much in Greenville, South Carolina, and he said, uh, you need to sell that house. And I thought, now Lord, you just gave us this house. We don't need to be <laughs> Certainly, let me do another loop and maybe a reconsider. <laughs> so as I went around again, uh, again, it was very clear. And this is how you know it's the Lord talking to you, because it will not be something you want to do a lot of the time. And so I said, okay, well, uh, here's the deal. You ever tell the Lord what the deal is? Here's the deal. Um, We'll sell our house. I'm not advertising. I'm not putting a sign in the yard. It's going to have to be one of those things where somebody just comes and says, hey, I like your house and I'll buy it. I mean, then I'll know it's for you. Then I'll know. Guess what happened? That afternoon, it was a Tuesday. My husband uh, had had gotten in the habit of going on Tuesday mornings to meet with some guys from church and they were at Chick-fil-A or some very holy place and, and they were chatting. Matt did not know what I had been uh, conversing with the father about. So he came home that day. We were scooping out, you know, preparing plates for dinner. Um, and he said, you will not believe what one of the guys said in the group today. I said, well, do tell. What is it? He said, if you were selling your house, he'd buy it. <laughs> So I said, call him. He's like, what? I said, no, 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 you don't understand. Today, out in the car, out in the yard, see, around, see how pretty it is? Uh, back there where I was cutting, this is the conversation I had. Call him. And he said, I said, I'll tell you what. I am all about following the leadership of my husband. You pray about it. If your prayers line up with my prayers, because neither one of us wanted to move at all. And so we liked our church, we liked our neighbors. My neighbor had the victory garden over there. We had fresh vegetables all the time. It was amazing. <laughs> Why would you leave that? You know, just like eating. But um, so, so uh, he said, you know, I'll, I'll give that some thought and I'll pray about it. Well, within a week, uh, we were selling our house. Seven days later, our house was sold. Within a month, we moved into a house, the same house we live in now, and for a city, we had a job. My kids were in school. We were in a completely different place. Now, that's the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. Well, three gentlemen. Uh, so, um, I love telling that story. You know why? It makes me seem very close to God. <laughs> There I was, <laughs> like a beacon of light. The Lord came and imparted this knowledge on me, and I said, yes, Lord, I'm willing, if you will. Know. You know what I always leave out of that story? Um, I leave out that the house that we put in an offer on, the other, the guy took another offer in the middle. Now, we went to see this house, and we said, this is it. This is our house. This is this is not at all what we thought we wanted, but this is our house. And we thought we had an agreement, and he took another house, another offer, and we came in. We're like, okay, when can we close? What? Okay, well, Lord, we were so sure that this was, now we've sold that house, we have nowhere to go. What? Uh, I better get on that lawnmower, because I do not understand. <laughs> I do not get this. You know, I leave all that stuff out. Because that's not really part of the story. Because you obviously see I'm here. I'm, I'm here. And after we uh, got here, I really started questioning at times what the Lord was doing. I mean, the, it didn't take long. Just the very first time I wanted to go to Target. <laughs> Can I get an amen from any of us? 45 minutes. Too far. Too dry. To target, just saying. So, but I have discovered, and this is going to be very spiritual. You can be away from target, but in the very center of the will of God. Can I get an amen? And David.
scripts are good. You know, sometimes it's good to just get out. Well, um, you know, I love looking in the Bible because so many times we think our stories need to be very clear cut. Our path in life needs to be very clear cut. Lord, I want it this way, and I want it to happen like this. I don't want to have any speed bumps, none of that stuff. And when I get from here to there, I want to know the entire time that this is exactly what the Lord wanted me to do. Anybody? Have you found any stories in the Bible like that? <laughs> me either. Me either. And, uh, and I will tell you tonight, you are not going to get um, any Hebrew, Greek, you know, ba you know, background kind of stuff. That is not where I live, ladies and gentlemen. Three of you. Um, it is, uh, you will get from me water. Okay? 20 years ago, this came to me this week, and how the Lord just brings a memory back to you. But 20 years ago, I was questioning some, some gifts and talents that I had. I was talking to this person who was very knowledgeable about all these things. I was just saying, I just I don't think I'm as good as that person over there. I don't think that I can do as well as that person. Look how gifted they are. And this person told me something that I'm telling you, and maybe you need to hear it tonight. The Lord does not want a fine cocktail of this and that and all of these. Not everybody has to be up here with their knowledge of Scripture. And their, Now, does He want you to study and know what you're talking about? Absolutely. But you don't have to be up here teaching classes at some seminary for the Lord to be able to speak to you. This is what He told me. Jesus gave them water. Just give them water. We all need water, don't we? You can't live without water. You can live without food. You can live, live without Target. You cannot live without water. So tonight, it would be a shame for me to drink alone. So would you drink with me? Just drink some water with me tonight. Well, that is what I invite you to do. Just come and drink. And uh, when I think, uh, think through the Bible, the story we're going to talk about is Joseph. And I, I love it because he is a dreamer. Do y'all remember your dreams? Like when you wake up in the morning, do you remember what you dream about? Anybody? Let me see. Do you? How many of you remember? You are. How many do not remember what you dream? And how many are just not going to answer no matter what I ask? I see anybody answering now? That's okay. That's okay. We we'll work with you. Well, my daughter Darby um, can remember in great detail every dream that she has. I said, you should really write these things down. In fact, just have a recorder, you know, on your phone. You just record it because she knows what the person is wearing and uh, what their motivation was. And it's like a movie, the whole thing. It takes forever for her to tell you about the dream because she knows every detail, but it's fascinating. I'm like, are you making this up? No, this is what happened. And he was there and she was there. And I don't know why he was there. Unbelievable. In my... Uh, my life, I'm sure I do dream. I don't remember any of them. In fact, I cannot even tell you one on one hand how many dreams that I remember in my life. The ones that I do remember usually are bad. You know, they're full of fear and anxiety and, and all those things. You know, I remember one time I was, I, I'd gone to, this is in my dream, I'd gone to the bathroom at my church and there was a giant chicken in there. <laughs> and every time, I can see it, I can see it. Every time I would try to scream, I just went. <laughs> Nobody could help me. I don't know if that was any foreshadowing about Sister Chicks, but, <laughs> but I remember that. That's not in the notes, that just came in. Uh, and if I do have a dream where I am just so excited and all that, when I wake up, I realize it's just a, it's just a dream. And then that, that feeling of, hmm, maybe I can go back to sleep and pick up on that. Well, um, in the Bible, God communicates over and over and over through dreams. We have the luxury of His Word. And I have my Bible back there, but I have to have the print so large now it was hard to carry out. So, uh, so I just have it written out on, this, on this, these pages. 
But he communicated over and over and over in visions and dreams. Visions, you're awake. Dreams, you're asleep. Now here's a little something for you. Only 21 dreams are recorded in the Bible. Only 21. 10 of them happen in the book of Genesis. I know, right? 10 are in the book of Genesis. The first one is when God stops Abimelech, the king, from sleeping with Sarah, Abraham's wife. That's in Genesis 20. The second is uh, when Jacob sees angels ascending and descending a ladder between earth and heaven. That's Genesis 20 and 12. The third is when the Lord tells Jacob to return to the land of his father. That's Genesis 31. And then the fourth is when God warns Laban not to bless or curse Jacob as he heads home. Three of them include, involve Jacob. And then the next six dreams, the rest of the dreams in Genesis, involve Joseph. I don't know about you, but anytime something is repeated in the Bible, or he says, verily, verily, any of those things, King James girls, uh, I pay attention. He says it a couple times. Well, Joseph not only had the gift of having a dream, but he also had the gift of interpreting the dreams. Now, I like to try to interpret dreams when Darby tells me what it was. I'm like, you know what that means, don't you? <laughs> I don't have the gift of interpreting dreams. I just like to kind of judge. But um, <laughs> I'll pray, Bobby. Don't pray for me. <laughs> and you know what? I would love to go in and read the entire book of Genesis to you because, man, if you like scandal, <laughs> you gotta go and read that stuff. I was I was looking through that. I mean, there's stuff in there that you would be like, that's in the Bible? I know not. So if you have skipped over Genesis, you need to go back and uh, and read a little bit of it. If you like any of those shows where this one's doing this to this one, oh my goodness, Genesis, come on. <laughs> but you know, background information is important. Before we get to Joseph, I just have to um, to let you know. That background information is important. Um, if I told you that my husband and I went to, to went, uh, we were actually born in the same hospital, um, just two days apart. Can you believe that? That is just amazing. Okay. Same nursery within two days. Wow. Um, and then if I told you we went to the same preschool, like from three k, four k, five k, and I noticed him across a crowded curve. <laughs> that I loved him from afar. <laughs> and he gave me this bracelet right here, and I've been wearing it since he gave it to me. I mean, just this little part of it. I just kind of tied it on this shiny one that I can't get off because my sleeves are too tight. <laughs> and I even wore this on our wedding day because I've had it since, you know, we were five. And it's just meant so much to me, and I, I, mean, I just, I've loved in my entire life. When you saw this bracelet, no matter how stained or tarnished it was, or how worn out, you would say, oh, that's a special bracelet. It has a story, and I understand what the story is. Now, none of that is true. Uh, we did not mean it to ask you. But if I told you that, that would be really special and really sweet. Well, I just want to, <laughs> we want to get to background information before we can uh, really understand some significant things that happened in Joseph's life. And if you haven't read about Joseph, I would encourage you to do that. I'm going to just kind of skim over some things today just to get in some points. I feel like the Lord is just uh, wanting me to share with you today. Um, and I've jumped in, but I just want to ask the Lord, Lord, would you pray with me? Lord, I've prepared all that I can for this. I've read and I've uh, made notes and I've done all that I can. And God, here it is. I've laid at your feet and ask you that you would just sift out what doesn't need to be said and that you would fill in what does need to be said, that it would touch the hearts of the women here and that there would be nothing that would be about Janet, but it would be all about you. God, you know who is here and who needs a word from you. And if, 
it's something different for everyone because we're all in different ages and stages of life. So today I just give it to you and ask you to just uh, hide me behind your cross. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. So, beginning in Genesis, and we have little boxes up here. Beginning in Genesis, it's divided into two different sections. If you, Genesis has 50 chapters. So it's divided into two different sections. The first section is all about creation, and it goes down into the, the, the Tower of Babel, and the, the Lord scatters all of them all over the place. And then the rest of Genesis focus on, focuses on one family. The bloodline goes, 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 goes. And then we hear what many of us have probably heard if you've been in uh, any kind of Bible study or, or church or anything, you hear about Abram. Okay, so Abram, will you give me the next slide, please? He's, he tells all of these people throughout, through you and your family, all the nations are going to be blessed. Well, there it is. There's the promise. So nothing bad can happen now, right? God gave the promise. That's, that's, it. that's great. Well, then we find on the next one that generations happen. And Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob was very busy and he has 12 <laughs> sons and a daughter that's not in this picture. I don't know where she was during the photo session, but <laughs> through several contributors, and you can read about that on your own time, Jacob has 12 sons. The one that we're focusing on today is Joseph. Now Joseph was the son of that came to Abraham from the one he loved the most. From the one he loved the most. Do you think the rest of those fellas knew that Joseph was the one that their daddy loved the most? Spoiler alert, they did know. You know why they knew? And here's one more reason, because his daddy made this really fancy coat for him. And you know how we can we can kind of think maybe that's why, but it even tells us in Scripture that not only did they not like him, they hated him. They hated him. Genesis 37, 3 and 4 said, Now Israel, also Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made him an ornate or fancy or technicolor or anything you want to say robe for him. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they knew it. They hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. But wait a minute. Joseph, we know, we've read ahead. We know how it ends. It's all the good stuff at the end. Why would he not have complete favor with everyone? Why would everybody like him? Even his own family didn't like him. I think, and I would just lay this out here for you, that Joseph was the product of not just a jacket. That's not why they hated him. He was the product after generations of mistrust, generations of betrayal, generations of broken promises. You see, Joseph's papa, his grandpa, Isaac, he had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Have you heard of Esau and Jacob? Seemed like things were going pretty well, but Jacob, the younger brother, wanted his family's inheritance. I've got one of those in my family. Any of you? Yeah. They deserve yeah. everything. Yeah, they don't. Um, which he wanted, he wanted the inheritance, which belongs to Esau, the older brother. Well, that is just the, you know, that's how it was culturally. The older brother got the blessing. So, and the inheritance. So Jacob with his mother's help because his mama liked Jacob best. Helps him cook up a plan, literally, because they make this stew, to steal the inheritance from his father, the blessing, the birthright. His daddy was now old and blind and he 
put fur on himself so he'd seem hairy like his brother and all these things. And so this is really bad. So get, get ready. You might say that Jacob wanted everything Esau. brother wanted what, you know? So Jacob wanted Esau's blessing, right? So then after they had this big conflict and Esau finds out and the whole thing, Jacob takes off. And he's out in the wilderness and that's where he finds the woman he wants to marry, the one he loves, and so he's tricked by Laban. And he ends up marrying Leah. You see this? Now we've got this bloodline of betrayal, mistrust, broken promises. He works for seven years. And poor Leah, she's described in the Bible as, depending on what translation, not real pretty. <laughs> she has weak eyes. I don't know what that means. Maybe some lashes would have helped. But not the winner. That really was the prize. Can you imagine on the wedding day when the veil was lifted? Oh, that lady going, gotcha. So, so within a week, he makes another plan. Uh, I've got this girl, but can I really want Rachel? Can I really, can I have Rachel? Can I, that's one. Okay, sure, fine. Work seven more years. She, she's yours. She's yours. That's a big layaway plan, ladies. Uh, But you know what? Oh, well then surely the promise of the Lord will be there now because nothing bad can happen except now Rachel cannot have children. Well, that did not quite work out, did it, for the promise of the Lord to be carried out through the one that you love. And so, as we already saw, there were lots of other involved ladies and they helped him uh, have many children, but the one he loved the most was Joseph. Lots of other details you could you could see. Have you ever had anything in your life, have any one in your life where you kind of felt the way the brothers do? You felt toward them the way the brothers do for Joseph? Now why are they getting everything? Lord, you know they're not even nice. Why do they get that nice call? They just want vacation for two weeks. You know they're not saving anything and tithe them. You know. <laughs> when I was a little girl, this is confession time. When I was a little girl, my granny, my mom was one of nine children, and she, uh, my grandmother was, we called her granny, because she was a granny. I mean, she made quilts, and she did the whole thing. Um, made biscuits every Sunday. It was just amazing. But she was on a very fixed income. Her husband had passed away, you know, back in 76. And so when I was growing up, she was, it was just granny by herself. And so she, but she made sure every Christmas we would have something, all the grandchildren. Now with nine children, you have a lot of grandchildren. And so we never expected much. But we knew that, um, that we would get a little something from her and we were happy because Greg's on a fixed income, you know. And so we, my brother and I went over there one year and we got this little package. And it wasn't a little package just for me or a little package just for John, my brother. It was a gift for John and Janet. <laughs> you know what it was? It was Jack Stones. Anybody ever played Jacks? <laughs> now you really need two people, so it seemed that's pretty logical. And I thought, yeah, you know what? That's kind of nice. So we played and played ones and twos and threes. And if you don't know what that is, Google it when you get home. Um, <laughs> but we were happy as could be, not expecting one thing, until. I went over to my cousin's house. Uh, she lived 
right beside my granny, and they saw each other lots and lots, and I only saw her once a week, and so that, you know, our relationship wasn't quite as tight as theirs was. Um, never noticed, though, until that day when I went over to her house, and she had on this handmade apron <laughs> in her favorite colors, hand-gathered, hand-embroidered, just for her. And I said, where did you get that? That is so cute. She said, Granny gave it to me for Christmas. <laughs> she made it for me. Look, my sister has one too. She made one for her too. I want to say, does it have a pocket? Maybe my jacks could fit in. <laughs> So here's some lessons. 
because nothing's wasted in the story and nothing's wasted in your story. So here's a few lessons. When I look in this, in this little part of the Bible at the very beginning, there's so much more after, but at the very beginning, here are five lessons that I can pick up from a dreamer, and maybe you can too. Lesson one, no wasted words. Confide cautiously. <laughs> Have you ever been so excited about something and you went to tell the wrong person about it and did not quite get the response that you thought you would? In fact, you came away more disappointed than you did when you went in. And I'll tell you, this is never more true than when you go and tell your um, unbelieving family or friends about what the Lord has done for you or revealed to you or any of, uh, anybody, can anybody relate to that? I mean, I, they don't get it. But the Bible said they wouldn't get it. They, the Bible says it's foolishness to those who don't believe. So why would we think they'd be happy for us But when we are so excited? And I'll tell you, if the Lord wanted everybody to know, including all those angry brothers, He would have sent them the dream. But he did not give them the dream. He gave, the jo he gave Joseph the dream. Now the Lord used Joseph's 17 year oldness, you know, to still carry out his plan. But I just wonder what it was that made Joseph want to share that whole dream. Was it just a, you won't believe this, I actually had a dream. Or was it Maybe they'll like me if I tell them this. Or maybe it was, he's just really dumb. I don't know. I don't know what it was. But what I do know is in my life, I have told things in confidence to people I never should have trusted with my confidence. And that's a hard lesson. So we can learn that from Joseph. Don't waste your words. Check your motivation for why you're sharing them. Come on. Is it because you just want them to know that the Lord talked to you on a lawnmower one day? <laughs> or is it because you feel like the Lord wants you to share it with them? Check that. Check that. That's for me too. When I was in high school, um, our school had something called Miss Heart School High. And the only way you could get in in this Hearts Will High, this was not something they announced on the football field or any of that. It was a pageant. And this was back in the 1900s. So people still did pageants. <laughs> I did not dream of being Miss Anything. That wasn't even on the radar. I, didn't, I certainly did not dream about being Miss South Carolina, ever. Didn't even know that was a possibility. I thought it was a television show. I did not even think about it. But when I was in high school, Miss Hartsville High was the, the, you had 10 from each grade, 10, 9th, 10, 11th, 12th, so you had 40 girls who would compete. They had to be voted in by their classmates. I never wanted to be Miss Hartsville High, but I did want to be in it. It had nothing to do with the dress. It had nothing to do with uh, going and getting my hair done. My dream was to be accepted. My dream was to be invited. My dream was just to be asked. Because I grew up uh, the youngest of four children. I did not have any fancy coats. All of our money really went toward my oldest sibling who was constantly in and out of jail or prison or some other state-run facility and we were constantly trying, my family was trying to bail, bail him out and trying to provide for him and give him one more chance and all those things and that's how I grew up. And, and that's not an oh poor me, that's just what it was. And so the idea 
that I could go and compete in anything and get a shiny hat was just not even on the radar. Not even. But when Miss Hartsville High came around, and in, not in ninth grade, I was not, um, I was not asked to be in it that year, but 10th grade, I remember when they made the announcement of the 10 girls from 10th grade who were in it, and they said my name. It was all I could do to look like I didn't care. <laughs> I know. Did you even think you'd meet her today? <laughs> it was really special. Um, I'll be signing autographs later. <laughs> but you know what that did? That little thing of being in that little high school Saturday evening event, it was nothing. I never got to change any rules or pick any lunchtime menus or any of the it was just one afternoon, and that's what you had. But that kind of sparked something in me, and um, that I liked dressing up. I liked getting on stage and singing and doing those different. I liked that, where a lot of people would be running from that. I don't want to be in front of anybody, but that feeling of being invited and connected. And now I had some cool dresses. <laughs> See, I never had a dream of being in South Carolina. I had a dress. <laughs> and so the next year, someone invited me to come and be in Miss Hartsville to represent the town. And so uh, to go to Miss South Carolina, that's how it works. When you go to in the Miss America system, you, you win a town. First you're a town, then you're a state, and then you go to Miss America. And so, um, so that year, I competed, and, the, and this lady said, you know, you've got a dress. I was like, well, yeah, come on. Sounded like they didn't have any contestants to be <laughs> That's the only criteria. You know, we're still breathing, right? Okay. So, so I, I went and competed for that. Did not win. But I was happy to be there. Several years went on like that, and, and so, um, so I did. I kept competing because it was something, there was something to do and I had this stuff. There was something in me that just drew me to that. And I was meeting people that weren't, well, in jail. I mean, there were a lot of people there that were different from what I grew up with, right? On the weekends, I could go to that instead of going to visit whoever my family was in jail. So it was a pretty, it was very different. But what I want you to hear from me is I never had the dream to go and earn scholarship. I had a dress. And I had a song. And it was terrible. But I had it. <laughs> and I learned throughout all those, those different uh, competitions and those different weekends where I would go and I'd I really feel like the Lord put people in my path that were helping me kind of not just for Miss South Carolina, but really shaping me into the person that I am now that he could use, polishing me a little bit. Now, was all of my family thrilled about that? <laughs> I'd love to tell you yes. But I got a lot of, who does she think she is? <laughs> I got a lot of, uh, well, that's as far as she'll go. My grandmother, not the granny who... Well, just be happy where you are because you, you probably not will go any farther than that. That was 
worse than the jacks. I'm just going to tell you that was worse for somebody not to believe in you. But, but you know, still undeterred. Maybe I was just really, really dim. I don't know. But, but what I do know is that all of that, those things, I just kept doing the next thing. I just kept doing the next thing. I didn't even know why I was feeling drawn to that. You know, uh, Talia has recorded now wherever you are. This has been a long time coming. A long time coming. She's been singing for years and years and years, and now she has a project that she's put out, and she's sharing songs with thousands and thousands every week. And But it didn't just happen. There are steps to that. Are y'all nervous that I've only done lesson one? <laughs> lesson two. No wasted lows. Appreciate the pit. And I'll tell you this. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just not thinking more of yourself than other people. I had to learn that too. When you are in the pit, it's hard to remember that the Lord has a plan for your life because you're thinking, now hang on, can't you imagine Joseph when he was down there? Now, what about those dreams? I bet he was not even thinking about those dreams. He was thinking, how am I going to get out of this mess? The Lord has surely left me. But over and over in Scripture it says, and the Lord was with them. And I'll tell you this, don't sell the pit short. Because that rejection you may be feeling may be the very protection that you need. You know what would have happened if Joseph had not been thrown into the pit? His brothers were going to kill him. Story of it. But one brother, who was very fiscally responsible, said, let's get some money for him. Why don't we get, we we'll probably sell him again a little bit. And so that's how he ended up in Egypt. Some of you have been in the pit, some emotional pits, and not a physical pit. You've been low. And you think, Lord, where were you when I was... I, where were you? Where are you now? And just like Joseph, the Lord is with you. Don't waste that. Don't waste this time to just be close to the Lord. And when you're that low, all you can do is look up. So look up to the hills from where your help comes from. The only godly influence I had in my life, in my immediate family, was my mom. Precious. Funny. So funny. She would say things that were completely irreverent and just really bad. You wouldn't want to say it to anybody else. Just silly stuff, you know. Nothing horrible. She loved Jesus. But she did say some funny stuff. And I, I, I'm telling you, we have laughed so much. And when she would laugh, her cheeks were just a little full. That's a nice way of saying she was chubby. Uh, her <laughs> cheeks were full. And when she would laugh, her eyes would close. You never wanted to tell her anything funny when she was driving. I was so bad. Got a little dicey. A little scary. She was by far biggest supporter, biggest spiritual influence in my life. If I ever had to go back and look at one person, she was it. She did not have a husband who went to church with her. She had this son who was constantly in and out of whatever he was into. And there were two other siblings in my family too. I'm the youngest, as I said before. But, um, but she was the one that you just look at her and say, that would call her and she would stop whatever she was doing and just pray. Sometimes I would get up in the middle of the night and I would go in and she would just be crying and just sitting in the front room in the dark just praying and praying and praying. That kind of influence. Well, certainly the Lord would let her stay a long, long, long time on this earth, right? You would think. But when I was in high school and I was doing the little Miss Hartsville High stuff,
stuff that I, I just told you about. The very one that would be the influence in my life, really the only spiritual influence in my immediate family, was diagnosed with stage four uterine cancer. And that was in the early 90s, pre-Google. Nobody was talking about menopause then. And she thought, well, I'm at that age. All these symptoms I'm having must be that. But nobody said anything about that. Because that was personal and private and she didn't want to share that with anybody. And so she just endured that for a long, long time until the symptoms got so bad that she finally went to the doctor and said, what is this? And it had just gone too far. She went through chemo and radiation and all those things that um, that you do. And so many of your loved ones, I'm sure, are going through right now. It's just, it's too much. We hear about it too much, but that's what she went through. And she got to a place at one point where she was exactly where you want to be if you've ever had cancer. I remember the doctor saying that. You're exactly where people want to be. Remission, complete remission. And then it came back somewhere else. And on January 3rd, 1995, she went home to be with the Lord. She was 57. I was 19. Both too young to have to deal with anything like that. That was a pit, ladies. It was the pits. And you think, how can the Lord use that in your life? Well, you know what? The next year was the year that I won Miss South Carolina. And I only did that because my dad wanted me to because he just needed something. So I thought I'll do it one more time because I went two times and got nothing. <laughs> Getting Jack is really kind of hard on my life story. <laughs> so the third time I went, I thought, I've already met Matt. We're going to get married as soon as this thing's over. And so I'm like, yeah, I'll do this one thing for my dad and I'll go and compete in Miss Southern 500. I'll be Miss Racetrack. You know, <laughs> I'll go get the scholarship. And let me tell you, there was no reason for me to get scholarship. No one in my family had ever gone to college or even thought about it. They didn't, that just wasn't on the radar. And here I was winning scholarship. I thought, well, I probably should do something with it. So I went to school. <laughs> it's the only place you can spend that gift card. You know? <laughs> Sorry, but I'm just bringing all this out to you. This is what happens in here, and I don't always let it out. Um, but the story of a mother with a legacy who loved me and who had just gone through what she had gone through, and I had seen her just carry on the love for Jesus even through the darkest time in her life, was the story that I was able to tell when I had that shiny hat and everybody was inviting me to go everywhere, and they would open their door for this Janet girl just because. I had competed in this thing and I won a title. And that started. Oh. <laughs> I was like, that was an awe moment. Okay. <laughs> I will tell you a story about this. When my mom, this is how, this is the kind of silly stuff she is. Now, when you win one day, you gotta blow a kiss to the crowd. <laughs> She's just funny. Got a little kiss to the crowd. She had died a year before that picture. Oh, I might not get through this. And so, here the girl is putting the crown on my head. And I remember, I remember my mom saying, you need to blow a kiss to the crowd. And I thought, I don't know who will even see this, but I'm just going to go blow a kiss to the crowd. And a guy in our town caught that picture. My favorite picture. You can't even see half of me, but I love it because I know exactly what's going on in my head at that moment. But from that really terrible year before to the next year, the Lord gave me something that I could go and use to share how He had ministered through my mom to me and how at that point I didn't even have children. How I wanted to carry on that legacy to someone else. 
And I remember I would even say when I was invited to churches all over the state and then beyond, and I was able to go to different, I mean, even to California at one point, and then lots of other states too. But um, it was nothing on me. It was just doing the next thing. Had nothing to do with my ability. If someone asked me if I would do something, I'd say, okay, okay, I will. Was I qualified? Absolutely not. But I would get I would get ready before it was time to do it. Because I thought that's another, that is another opportunity. And so that's lesson four. Did I do three? <laughs> oh Lord. Uh, lesson three. I've been talking about that. No wasted choices. Choose character over career. You're going to have times in your life, just like Joseph did, where he could have put that promise, put that calling aside, and, and thought, the Lord is not with me. But you'll have to make a choice. You know, I wonder in prison what his conversation was with all the people around him right before he... They found out he could interpret dreams. Let me tell you, if I landed in a pit after talking about dreams, I would have never talked about dreams again. You understand? <laughs> so whenever he actually used the gift that God gave him in prison, he had to have recognized that that was from the Lord. So that's what I'll say about that. The boy in the coat did not have what he needed to lead a country out of famine. But every situation in his life, God was preparing him step by step by step. So that's lesson four. No wasted time. Just do the next thing. That's what I'm learning about this. Do the speech of burning class. Because I liked that. Where most people were hiding in the back. I liked that. And so I was able to get that degree and I was able to go and, and share and keep singing and go lead worship and all these different things. And do you know now, I am a full-time worship leader at Second Baptist Church and I've been there for eight years. It's the longest I've ever had a job other than being a mom. And, uh, and it's because, that was a joke, um, because <laughs> of all the things leading up to, I'm doing exactly what I feel like the Lord was leading me, has a plan for me. This was my purpose. But it's all the things before this that led up to that. It's for such a time as this that the Lord gave me that opportunity. And in your life, I wonder what it is the Lord's preparing you for, what He has already prepared you for. I would encourage you when you go home, take a little evaluation. Look over your life and say, that didn't make sense. But you know what? If it had not been for that, I would not have been here. Man, that person hurt me. But if I had not had that happen, I wouldn't have met that person. And I wouldn't have moved to this place. And then I wouldn't be here. See what I'm talking about? So trace it back in your life. Amen. Amen. The Lord says, you know, whenever, whenever Joseph was given that dream, I bet he thought it was all about status. I'm going to be here and they're going to be bowing down to me. And the Lord showed him through many, many, many years of ups and downs. It had nothing to do with status. It was about service. And that's our wall too, ladies. It is not about status. This is not about trying to be somebody and trying to have other people wait on us. Jesus washed feet. We're here to serve just like he, he, he said for us to. You know, lesson number five. Thanks for hanging in. No wasted threads. Acknowledge the artist and trust the process. If you were to copy someone's work, their written work, that would be plagiarism. If you were to take credit for someone else's song or some other written, that would be copyright infringement. Don't take credit for what the Lord has done in your life. It's easy though, isn't it? We want to say, look what I did. I'm so good, I'm so gifted, I'm so this, I'm so that. But 
the Lord is reminding me and maybe reminding you, don't take credit for that. The gifts you have, guess where they came from? The opportunities you have, guess where they came from? You might think it's because you're good, but you're only good at what you're good at because the Lord enabled you to be and gave you the opportunity to be. Now I'm wrapping this up. But this is how we look in God's Word and say, now how did Old Testament, why does that mean anything to me? We know how it ended and then, you know, you kind of trace it through. I want you to just fast forward 40 generations. That's a lot of great grandpas. Great, 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 great. 40 generations. When Jesus was on the scene, remember when he said, I need to go through Samaria. I need to go through Samaria. I'm going to go to Galilee, but I need to go through Samaria. Nobody went through Samaria. No Jews went through Samaria. That was trash. But he said, not only I'm going to go, but I need to go. Do you know who he saw in Samaria? Yes, we The woman at the well. Do you know where, what well that was? It was Jacob's well. On the land 40 generations ago that the Lord gave him near Shechem. He put that well there, gave it to Joseph, and now 40 generations later, there is this woman was she a biblical scholar? <laughs> nope. Was she um, high, uh, had this high reputation and status in society? No, she was getting water in the middle of the day when it was the hottest because she was so, this is not biblical, skanky. <laughs> didn't want to go with her in the morning when they normally went. So she was there by herself. And who did she meet? Jesus. Did he care that she didn't have status? Did he care that she didn't have a college degree? Did, she, did he care that she had a thing? No, he said, I need to go through Samaria, there's someone there I need to meet. Now, we don't get that. That's parentheses. There's someone there that I have an appointment with. And she's thirsty. Thirsty people will drink anything. But Jesus knew what she needed was water. And he talked to her and told her everything that she had ever done and still said, I can give you water and you'll never thirst again. Some of us in this room are just thirsty. And we're looking in all the wrong places. I know when I am super hungry, and I haven't eaten all day. I'll come home. I'm sure none of you do. And I'll stand in front of that pantry. I'm not counting uh, health benefits. I'm not looking at boxes to see how many carbs are in it. I'm just hungry. And I will eat anything that is in there to fill me up. Some of us are doing that in our own lives. We are thirsty for love and acceptance and an invitation. And we're accepting anything that we see just to try to feel filled.
But the Lord says, I'll give you water and you'll never thirst again. I'll give you love and you'll never look for love again because you'll never have the love like I'm going to give you. I'll give you acceptance like you've never had before. So you won't have to look for it in all these other places. I'll give you the desires of your heart. You won't even want what you used to want. You'll want me. Amen. Yeah. 
to be able to prepare and to keep you way longer than you thought you were going to be here. It has been my honor. I know that you gave up so much to be here, to be away from your family. Some of you, you're welcome. But for the rest of you, you sacrificed time to be here. Some of you did not want to be here. Your friend would not leave you alone and you came anyway. I know that. But this was not a chance encounter to be here with a bunch of women. This was a divine appointment to be with one man. And he's the only man that I know that a whole room full of women can be in love with him and they still want to share it with him.